Hi, Will Duvall here, lead pastor of West Hills Church, and on behalf of all of us at West Hills, I just want to thank you for watching this sermon online. If you're watching this, you're likely one of two people. Either you belong at West Hills already, or you're checking us out for the first time. And so let me address both those. First of all, if you're a West Hillian, uh, just a reminder, this is no replacement for being with the gathered church on Sunday morning. And similarly, even if you're new, I hope that this sermon gives you a taste of who we are. But I'll just encourage you to, there's no replacement for uh, being with the gathered church and, and worshiping together, fellowshipping together, sharing the Lord's Supper together, that Sunday morning experience that we can't replicate here online. So for both of you, I want to encourage you to come join us this Sunday at 1030. Uh, we'll hope to see you there. This morning, um, we are going to be in Mark chapter 8, if you, I suppose, want to start turning there. Um, in 1937, Dietrich Bonhoeffer published a book entitled The Cost of Discipleship, in which he argued that as Christianity grew and eventually uh, became the official state religion of entire empires, that the cost of true discipleship, of actually following Jesus, became deemed too great a price to expect most people to realistically pay. And so rather than confront society with Jesus's original radical demands of discipleship, the church instead began to conform itself to the surrounding society and its demands. And for Bonhoeffer, this explained why the 20th century European church, for the first time ever in the history of the church, was actually beginning to die out and to shrink. It wasn't that the church had raised the bar too high and kept people from coming to Jesus. It was that she had set the bar too low and in an attempt to include everyone and begun to sell what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. He says, the price we are having to pay today in the collapse of the organized church is only the inevitable consequence of our policy of making grace available to all at too low a cost. We gave away the word and the sacraments wholesale. We baptized, confirmed, and absolved a whole nation without condition. We gave that which was holy to the scornful and unbelieving, but the call to follow Jesus in the narrow way is hardly ever heard. Bonhoeffer defined cheap grace as preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. And so friends, this morning as we continue our exposition of the Gospel of Mark together, we need to be reminded that it is not for us to ask Jesus to conform to our culture, to our expectations of him, to our lifestyles, to what we think is realistic of him to ask of us, but rather we need to let Jesus confront us this morning with his radical call to discipleship again. And lest you think that um, we're pretty good about this as a church, and we are, and I so appreciate that about West Hills, but lest you think we don't ever deal with this at all, this, this temp temptation to lower the bar, I would just be honest and share with you that um, in my five months now as your lead pastor, I have from some, not the majority, from some, I have fielded um, concerns about my sermons containing too much conviction, too much challenge. We're gonna scare off first time visitors. Um, I have fielded questions about why we ask non-believers to abstain from taking the Lord's Supper with us. Um, isn't that kind of exclusive? It's going to make them feel awkward and isolated, not very hospitable. We shouldn't make that big of a deal about it. I've been asked why we have an interview process for membership. Missy mentioned the membership. Why do we interview people for membership? If someone is voluntarily getting out of bed on Sunday morning to come worship with you, voluntarily tithing and paying your salary, pastor. If someone is voluntarily dealing with your toddlers in there on a Sunday morning, what's, what's left to interview? And moreover, do we even need church membership? Won't that make some people feel like outsiders? 
to class system. See, lowering the bar to include everyone wasn't just a temptation for the 20th century European church. It is the single biggest threat to the 21st century American church today. And as we recognized last week in the sermon on Jesus versus religion, our primary problem is not external. Yes, we live in a rapidly secularizing society that tells us there is no need for grace because there's nothing wrong with us. We just need to accept everyone exactly as they are. Yes, that kind of stinking thinking can start to creep its way subtly into the church, and that's dangerous. But it's not as dangerous as what's already on the inside. It's what the in, on the inside that counts, that which comes out of the church that truly defiles us. And the greatest threat to the gospel today is not in the world. It's in the church. And the church twisting and distorting the gospel into cheap grace in order to pad our baptism stats and fill our church coffers. But in Mark chapter 8 this morning, Jesus is going to raise the bar for us. He's going to ask us to count the cost of truly following him. And Jesus used the illustration in Luke chapter 14 of building a tower. Which of you, he said, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. And so this morning, we're going to collectively count the cost together. Actually, the costs, plural, as you see in your bulletin of discipleship, four of them, four costs that I see in this text. So would you turn with me again to Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38, and would you stand with me as you're able for the reading of God's word? I'll read it for us. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we want this morning to set our minds not on the things of man, but on the things of you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, that you have not left us in this world to stumble around and search for the answers on our own. It's not religion, us making sense of you. It's revelation, you coming down to make things clear for us. And so Jesus, this morning, even as you make the cost of discipleship clearer to us, maybe in some ways that challenge us, would you break, mold, shape hearts this morning? Soften hearts uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit and give us the, the grace and the faith to conform our lives 
to you and not ask you uh, to do that for us. Uh, Father, we want to be conformed more to the image and likeness of your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Cost number one of discipleship is submission. Submission, verses 27 to 30. Following Jesus will cost you your pride. It will necessarily require you to lay down your pride, to submit, and bend your knee to a new king, to King Jesus. Consider Jesus' interaction with the disciples here in verses 27 to 30. There are so many things that we could glean and pull out from this pivotal passage in Mark 8, especially if we were to pull in the parallel text from Matthew's chapter 16 and all the things you've got going on there and building the church on the rock and Peter and the full version of the conversation. But I just want to focus on one implication of this exchange between Jesus and his disciples. So Jesus puts them on the spot. Spot. He asked them, okay, who, who do others say that I am? But then he turns and he makes it personal and he asks them, the disciples, to answer for themselves. But who do you say that I am? And the you is emphatic in the Greek. And for them to answer as Peter does, that you are the Christ. Uh, the Greek word is Christos. It's a Hellenization of the Hebrew word Messiah, Mashiach, which means the anointed one. You are Israel's long-awaited uh, prophesied and promised Savior from the Old Testament, now come in the flesh. And in Matthew's Gospel, Peter adds, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. For Peter to profess that means that he is acknowledging that as the Messiah, Jesus deserves his submission and his obedience. Jesus, you are the Messiah. Uh, I am not. You're, you're the anointed Savior, which means, number one, I, Peter, am not, and number two, that I need a Savior. I'm a sinner. For me to confess you as the son of the living God is to confess that there actually exists this higher power uh, to whom I must one day answer, before whom I ought to willingly submit. Philippians 2 says that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But we can either bend our knees voluntarily in humble, willing, joyful submission to the good king who is worthy of our allegiance, or I can be made to bend the knee on the day of my reckoning, and that is not a place you want to be in. And nothing else flies in the face of 21st century American culture quite like this call to submission. I know I've mentioned this in recent sermons, but this is so thoroughly ingrained in our collective cultural psyche these days that it bears reiterating that nothing defines Americanism today. You know, they say that you are what you celebrate. What do we celebrate as a society more than our two chief virtues? Pride and autonomy. We are a proud people. It's in our songs. I'm proud to be an American. Our country was built on hard work and self-determinism. The pioneer spirit, do it yourself, roll up your sleeves, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. If you work hard enough, that's the American dream. You set your mind to it, you can be anything. That, that kind of pride. And autonomy, radical individualism, freedom, independence, self-expression, the heroes we grew up on, I've said it before, Ariel, Aladdin, Jasmine, Mulan, Moana, Elsa. We celebrate, we teach our kids to celebrate that follow your heart mantra. Wherever it leads you, right? No matter what it costs you, your relationships, follow your heart. You do you. Forget about anybody who tells you, tries to tell you who you ought to be, what to do. No, you do you. It is self-expression, personal autonomy at all costs. And here comes Jesus in Mark 8. 
asking us, demanding us to lay down our pride, to lay down our autonomy at the altar of following him. There's no room for pride, he says. It's the sick who need the doctor, not the healthy. So if you're still clinging to your pride and thinking that you're healthy enough to accomplish it, if you haven't yet looked down and realized you're naked, you have exactly zero bootstraps by which to pull yourself up. If you haven't gotten there yet, Jesus says, I can't help you yet. There's new room for autonomy. Jesus will say in just a moment, in verse 34, if you won't deny yourself, say no to your heart and following your heart, your dreams, your individualism, your freedom, your self-expression in order to say yes to me instead, then I cannot help you yet. American evangelicalism's gospel has all too often become Jesus loves you so much that he died to save you from your sins so that you can go to heaven. And while that gospel isn't inaccurate, it is woefully, horribly incomplete. It is dangerously me-centric. Jesus loves me so much. He died to save me so I can go to heaven. Jesus becomes a means to an end. Friends, the gospel is about God. It's about God's glory. His kingdom come in the person and work of Jesus. That's the gospel. Do you know what title the New Testament uses for Jesus far more than Savior? Now listen, we need a Savior. We are in desperate need of a Savior. And praise the Lord, Jesus is our Savior. And he's called that 15 times in the New Testament. But friends, as much as we need a Savior, we also, we equally need a Lord. We need a God. We need a kurios, a master. We need someone to turn our lives over to because we don't have the first clue how to run them. And thank God that Jesus is that too. He, he offers graciously to be that for us. And he's called Lord 667 times in the New Testament. Lord and Savior. They're not synonyms. And if you're here this morning and you have attempted to entrust your eternal destiny to Jesus without ever laying your life down in order to follow him, let me just be very blunt and very biblical with you this morning. You are not a Christian. You're not saved. Unless Jesus is your savior and your Lord. He has no desire to merely be your get out of hell free ticket. He is not peddling cheap grace this morning. He turned a lot of would-be followers away in the Gospels. He wants so much more than that for you, with you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants your heart, and he won't settle for anything less this morning. But it's got to be on his terms. Discipleship demands our submission. Jesus is not interested in coming along for the ride. He must be in the driver's seat. Anyone else like to drive? Anyone else hate to let their wife drive? <laughs> Anyone else hate to be in second place? We walk the dog every day in every single walk. Every single walk, Polly and I uh, take the dog on. I'll be talking with her. All of a sudden, I'll look around like, where'd Polly go? and I'm 10 steps ahead of her. And I'll confess to you, it has much less to do with the relative lengths of our legs than it does with me uh, never having been comfortable with being in second place. And somewhere in my unconscious mind, I'm wired to be so competitive, so driven, that even a family dog walk turns into a competition, and by God, I'm gonna win it. <laughs> I don't like to follow people. Dad's like, who am I interviewing to work for? <laughs> submission is hard, isn't it? Anyone else here married? Is submission hard? Mutual submission, Ephesians 5? 
I am preaching to myself this morning. I'm chief among sinners. But friends, it is the cost. Submission is the cost, and it's a good thing because Jesus knows far better than you or I do how to drive, how to navigate the road ahead. He deserves, he demands our submission today. Give it to him this morning and watch him transform your life in ways that you never could have in your own strength. Cost number two of discipleship is suffering. Verse 31, we hear Jesus begin to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days he will rise again. Serving a suffering Savior is in and of itself a form of suffering. Can you imagine the disciple, disciples' inner turmoil for those three days after Jesus' death? You want to talk about PTSD. Imagine watching the guy that you had risked everything for, bet your life on, given it all up for, left everything you know, your family, put your eternal hope and faith in. You were convinced this really was the Messiah. Watching him be brutally tortured and ripped to shreds and bleed out in front of your own eyes. But it wasn't just the inner agony of watching someone else that they loved suffer. Jesus was very clear that signing on to be his disciples means that we too must suffer. He alluded to this in our parable from a few weeks ago, from Mark 4, when persecution arises on account of the word, immediately some will fall away. He's more explicit elsewhere. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Matthew 24, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. Not might, they will deliver you. Uh, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. In John 15. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as one of its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And right here in verse 34, Jesus is going to warn them that following him will mean taking up their crosses. It's an instrument of torture. Take up your electric chairs and follow me. He's saying the cost isn't just denying yourself, it's actually dying to yourself. Die to yourself. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Colossians 3, 5, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry. Being raised to new life in Christ requires us to die to ourselves first. Anybody here die lately? I haven't, but from what I gather, it does not look like much fun. And as someone who has died to my sin, to my selfish, fleshly nature, on my good days, I still die to my sin. I still put to death my earthly desires. That's a daily battle. It's a daily choice. But it's not always fun, is it? It's liberating. It's freeing. But it isn't always fun. That's why C.S. Lewis in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the third Narnia book, depicts it in allegorical terms through the character Eustace as a dragon being stripped of his scales. Aslan, the god lion, tells Eustace, if you want to be transformed from the dragon that you've turned yourself into back into a human boy, I can do it for you, but it's going to hurt. And so Eustace says, I was afraid of his claws, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right to my heart. And when he began to pull the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I had ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. Is that about nail it, Christians? Dying to our flesh, dying to our, ourselves, dying to our sin. 
Friends, let me ask you this morning, are you suffering for Christ? I'm not just talking about the persecution that Jesus predicted. Sure, our faith should cost us something in a world that is increasingly hostile to the Christian worldview, but I'm talking even more about what it costs you in here. Remember, the main problem is not out there. The main problem is in here. And so I ask again, what is your commitment to Christ costing you in here? What are you saying no to in order to say yes to Jesus? What sinful, fleshly impulses, what self-indulgences are you denying, putting to death in order to choose life in Christ instead? I'm preaching to myself this morning. A faith that costs you nothing is worth exactly what you paid for it. Let me say that again, because that's good. You might want to write this one down. A faith that costs you nothing is worth exactly what you paid for it. Cost number three of discipleship is surrender. Verses 32 and 33. This point goes hand in hand with submission, but it takes it even a step further because Jesus not only calls us to lay down our pride and recognize that we are not the Messiah, but because of that, he also calls us to surrender our will to his, to hand over our control, our plans to him. Any control freaks in the room won't make you raise your hands. Consider verses 32 and 33 here. Jesus, for the first time in Mark's gospel, predicts his own death in verse 31. And he said this to them plainly, we hear in verse 32. Mark wants to be clear that the reason Peter admonishes Jesus wasn't because he misheard Jesus. This was not a simple miscommunication. So what is Peter's response to Jesus' death prediction? Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Rebuke is a strong word here. To rebuke is to express sharp, stern disapproval. Again, Mark does not want us to be confused and to feel sympathy for Peter here. Like this was not a heartbroken Peter pleading with Jesus in tears for his beloved friend. No, Peter took Jesus aside. Hey, Jesus, come here a minute. I need to talk to you, Jesus. The same Peter who had to be saved from drowning because of his little faith. The same Peter who's about to deny Jesus three times lest his faith cost him some persecution. That Peter needs to put Jesus in his place. Says, Jesus, come here. Come here. Let's talk. I got a bone to pick with you. And he takes him aside and he rebukes Jesus. Rebukes Jesus. What is Jesus' response? Verse 33, but turning and seeing his disciples, see, it wasn't just Peter. They were all thinking the same thing. Wait a minute, Jesus. We just, you just acknowledge you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. If you're really sovereign, sovereign over the wind and the waves, the loaves and the fishes, the demons and sickness, Jesus, if you're really that kind of God, just rewrite the plan. I mean, this seems like a bad plan, Jesus. You don't have to suffer and die. That's what they're all thinking. Peter's just the only one with the cojones to say it out loud. You don't have to do this, Jesus. But Jesus says you're wrong. Verse 31, I just told you, the Son of Man must be rejected and suffer and die. Not he might be rejected and suffer and die. Not he will, not even he will, he must. To which Peter says, no, Jesus, listen. To which Jesus says, no, Peter, you listen. Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You care about your plans, Peter, not mine. Friends, I want to ask you this morning, what's the most obvious example in your life of something that seems so clearly to be not in God's plan. 
the life circumstance that you're facing right now that most has you questioning God's sovereignty, his supreme power and absolute control over everything. At one time for me, it was my parents' divorce. Nothing good can come of that. It's not God's plan. Later, it was not getting the job offer I wanted, not having the marriage I wanted. What is it for you? And have you realized yet that God's plans for your life are always so much better than your own? That as Isaiah 55, 8 tells us, your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord, and that that's a really good thing. If there was ever a plan that appeared to be not God's plan, it was this one. The suffering, rejection, and death of the Messiah, his only son. No way. That can't be God's plan. But Jesus says, Peter, your ways are not my ways. In fact, on this one, Peter, this part of the plan is so crucial. It is the centerpiece of all of human history that Peter, to buck against me on this point and assert your will over mine in this instance, Peter, is nothing less than a plan from Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Even the Pharisees only got called sons of the devil by Jesus. Right, Jesus reserves his most severe reprimand in all the Gospels for Peter here. Because following Jesus means surrendering our will to his. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not mine, but your will, O Lord. And I guess at the end of the day, it really boils down also to a matter of facing the facts. Because the fact is, I have little to no control over most of what happens to me in a given week. I didn't choose to get a flat tire last week. I didn't choose to have a headache all day Wednesday. I didn't choose to have my Bible chewed up. That was my demonic dog, she chose that. <laughs> On a more serious note, you don't choose cancer. You don't choose to lose a child. You don't choose to have your husband leave you. But the cross proves that God can and will and wants to take what seems to be the worst of all plans and redeem it and use it as the very means for accomplishing his perfect purpose in our lives. And I can rail against the plan. I can blame God. I can blame others. I can let the little bit of control that I do have turn me into to a control freak. And I can try and micromanage everyone else's life for them too to get them to conform to my plan. Or I can face the facts and surrender my will, my plans, my control. Because... It, at the end of the day, it's an illusion anyways. Proverbs 16, 9 says, In his mind, man makes the plans, but it is the Lord who directs his footsteps. I can surrender to the one who numbers the stars and numbers the hairs on my head and choose to trust his plan even when I don't understand it. That's my choice. That's your choice this morning. That much we do have control over. Not what happens to us, but whether or not we will accept it with open hands. That's the plan of a good and sovereign God who knows what he's doing. Finally, cost number four of discipleship is self. Following Jesus will cost you your self. It will cost you your very life. We've touched on this one already anyway, so I'll be short. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. As Bonhoeffer put it, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And here's the question that some of you should be asking at this point this morning. Why would anyone want any part of this? <laughs> right? 
I mean, you're telling me that following Jesus is going to cost me my pride, my autonomy. I'm going to have to submit to him, take new marching orders. It's going to cost me suffering. That doesn't sound fun. It's going to cost me my plans, my will, my control. I have to surrender all of that to Jesus too, and it's going to cost me my life, like life as I know it. I gotta take up a cross, put to death the old sinful ways, repent, turn from my sin in order to follow him. You Christians are crazy. This does not sound like the good news that, that you guys preach at all to me. Where is the good part in all of this? If that's the cost, what does it even purchase me if I pay this cost? For those who count the cost and give Jesus our submission, our suffering, our surrender, ourselves, what is the reward? And Jesus' answer this morning is everything. It's everything. Yes, it costs you everything because it cost him everything his own infinitely valuable life. And so yes, it will cost us everything too. You must lay down your life in return. But the reward is everything. It's new life in him. Eternal life with him in glory forever. The reward is your soul. Number one, reward number one of discipleship is your soul. Verses 36 and 37. I mean, if you're here this morning and you are counting the cost and you're honestly a little skeptical, you're doing the math, like that seems like a high cost to pay. You're right. But you've got to admit, Jesus makes a pretty compelling case here. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul for what can a man give in return for his soul? This life is a blip on the radar of eternity. And if your hope is not ultimately in Jesus, then let me just, as you know, lovingly as I can this morning, ask you, what is the plan? Like, what, what, what is your plan for eternity? I think of those retirement investment commercials. What's your retirement plan? Do you know your number? You know, how much you need to have saved? What, what about your ultimate retirement, friends? Retirement from this world. What's the plan? If your hope is in your money, are you planning to take that with you? How's that going to work? Are you going to offer it to Jesus to buy a ticket into heaven for eternity? If your hope's in your family, are you hoping that one of them can like vouch for you at the gates of heaven? I'm with him. If your hope is in your good deeds, are you just crossing your fingers and hoping that they're good enough? Like what, what, what is your eternal plan? When Jesus asks you at the gates of heaven that question, who do you say that I am? Not, not your, your parents, not your family, not your church that you attended, not your pastor. Who do you say that I am? Jesus says you can gain the whole world, everything the world has to offer, and there's no exchange rate for purchasing your soul back. <laughs> You've got worldly currency if you gain everything in the world, and only spiritual currency is accepted here in heaven. You want security in your eternal retirement, friends. You're going to need reward number two, the son's approval. You need the approval of the son. Verse 38, Jesus says, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the son of man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. But... The converse of that is also true this morning, friends. This is the good news, that whoever is not ashamed of Jesus, whoever acknowledges him in this generation, in this life that he gives you here on earth, whoever, if you confess him as the Messiah, as the son of the living God, if you give him your submission, your suffering, your surrender, your whole self, you will be saved. That's the good news. 
Bonhoeffer said, we'll close with this. Costly grace is the gospel. Not cheap grace. Costly grace is the gospel. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ and he is good. It is costly because it will cost you your life and it is grace because it gives you the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. And what has cost God so very much cannot be cheap for us. But above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life and he delivered him up for us. Friends, will you count the cost and will you follow him today? Let's pray.